Hello, I'm Pete Leiden. I'm the founder of reInvent. It's a media company that's focused on the future. And I'll tell you, the future is about as uncertain as it's ever been uh, with this coronavirus crisis we're in right now. Uh, now, everybody, pretty much in any country, uh, their plans for 2020 have been blown to pieces in the last few weeks, if not the last month or so. And many people are trying, everyone's trying to figure out what is in store ahead in the months ahead and particularly through, even through the year ahead. Like how do you start to even think about what's ahead and how you start to really think, plan them and think through what you should be doing about this. Whether you run a company, whether you're working in a company, when you're in an organization, whether you're just trying to figure out what the heck you can resume your life ahead. Now it turns out there's a, there's a, a tool or essentially a process uh, that has really about how to think more strate more rigorously about the future, more systematically about the future. And it's a thing called scenario planning. And uh, it's a methodology that's been developed, let's say in the second half of the 20th century, a robust set of um, uh, processes, tools, ways of thinking that many companies, uh, global corporations, particular governments, government agencies uh, use particularly to think more uh, thoroughly about what might lie ahead 10 years and even longer in the future. And today we have really one of the world's uh, leading practitioners of this art, uh, Peter Schwartz. Now, Peter Schwartz uh, began in this space uh, back with Royal Dutch Shell, uh, which was really one of the pioneer, pioneering company in using these techniques to kind of use their strategic planning going forward uh, back in the kind of second half of the 20th century there, he then went on to found, um, with Stuart Brand among others, uh, Global Business Network. And GBN really became known in its time as one of the really premier places in the world to develop uh, these scenarios and to help, like I say, corporations, government agencies uh, think more accurately or as, as best they can about the future. Uh, Peter then has also, he, he's got a long, say, uh, background, but uh, I would say since about 2011, he's been working with Mark Benioff in Salesforce. Uh, he kind of built the futures team in there, and he has been uh, using a lot of these techniques and ways to think about the future for that company. And even in the last few weeks uh, with this coronavirus uh, crisis, he's been uh, mobilizing a team of insiders and outsiders to actually work up some ways to think about this. And one of the things we're going to do today is be able to talk about that. Final little note here is I know Peter well from way back. I did work at Jimmy uh, for a time there uh, with Peter and Stuart and the rest of them. And I first met Peter when I was working at Wired Magazine and we co-authored a, a cover story and later a book called The Long Boom. Uh, it was a look from the mid 90s out to the year 2020 and how the world could, the story of the world to 2020. And here we are. And one thing, Peter, we didn't project was a global pandemic to cap the whole thing off. So anyhow, welcome, Peter, to the conversation today. Glad to be with you, Pete. Well, so I tell you what, um, can you just help people it, it, just to start this conversation? Think a little bit when you when you when someone when you're first explaining scenario planning to someone, just how, how do you kind of explain to them the importance of this and a little bit about what the process is to give them kind of a sense of why they're so why it's so valuable? Sure, uh, it's, it's actually not very complicated. It, uh, scenario planning is a tool for making better decisions in the face of uncertainty. It's not a tool for trying to predict the future. Uh, nobody can predict the future. However, I mean, there's an old Arab saying that he who predicts the future lies even if he tells the truth. Uh, <clears throat> so this is not a tool for prediction, it's a tool for insight and for gaining uh, an understanding of where things may be headed and how you can make better decisions. So it basically looks at all the forces potentially shaping the future, demographic and social and economic and technological, how they interact over time and how they create different possibilities for the future. So good scenario planning involves essentially telling yourself multiple stories about possible futures and then trying to look at how your decisions might fare under each of those possibilities and then make better choices so you don't make fatal mistakes and that you do take advantage of opportunities that may be arising in front of you. And clearly in this uh, uh, COVID coronavirus crisis, uh, we have never faced more uncertainty than we face today. So it's not surprising I'm spending a lot of my time these days doing scenario planning with a variety of organizations, including Salesforce. Totally got you. So, so basically, it's a process of 
again, not predicting, but kind of expanding the ideas of what's possible out there. And then, but also making, there's a process to plan and think through and how would you kind of deal with these various strategies and kind of even think of more robust strategies that might work for more than one. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. So then now, given the crisis here that's happened, uh, can you say a little bit about what you have been doing um, sure. with Salesforce and, and just a little bit of just the, what, what you've been doing in process and we'll get into what you came up with later. Well, not, not surprisingly, uh, we, we are very interested, like most companies, uh, just saying my, my computer here seems to be being pulled by it. Oh, that's the problem, just a second. Uh, all right, there we go. Uh, the, it, it is obvious that we face a lot of uncertainty as a company, um, and our customers face a lot of uncertainty. And we also work with a lot of government agencies that also face a lot of uncertainty, uh, like the state of California, just to take a real example. And so uh, a number of the people that I've worked with over the years, most of them are people that you know, uh, Pete, people like mm -hmm. Kevin Kelly and Stuart Brand and Catherine Fulton, Danny Hillis. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, as all of this began to develop a few weeks ago, we said we ought to get together and start thinking together about where the world might be headed. And so we brought together with some of my friends who are now at Deloitte, uh, Andrew Blau and Eamon Kelly, uh, who ended up buying GBN a number of years ago. Uh, we all came together in a series of video conferences to start to develop a set of scenarios that our respective organizations could use to think about the future. Uh, and, and the honest truth is that uh, I don't think we came up with anything radically different than most people are seeing. Uh, it, it won't surprise you that there's a lot of scenarios being published today. You know, McKinsey has, uh, BCG has, Goldman Sachs has, uh, and so on. And, and they're all looking at many of the same uh, things that uh, are uh, that we looked at. So there's a very common uh, uh, set of concerns, issues, and dynamics that a lot of people are thinking about, uh, and that we went through in some depth. Not surprisingly, these things are moving rather quickly, and so uh, we'll revisit them again this week, bring the team back together and say, all right, now given what has happened over the last 10 days or so, uh, what do we think? Now, so just just to kind of, if you can, a little bit of sense. So, how long ago were you started on this? Because because and you worked these up. Was it been the last couple of weeks or, or something yes. like that? Or even we quicker? started a few weeks ago, uh, and we started presenting them and sharing them last week. And we were looking at short, medium, and long term scenarios. So, not surprisingly, uh, people are really concerned about what to do right now. Uh, and so. And there's still very large short-term uncertainty, e.g. what's going to happen with the virus, what's going to happen with the economy, what's going to happen with politics, and so on. Uh, well, <clears throat> so uh, there, there was a lot of concern about that. But as we make decisions about the short run, they have long-term implications, uh, both in the kind of medium and longer term. And so we wanted to give people a sense of what those possibilities were likely to be as a result uh, to have a... Uh, uh, a set of uh, visions of where this all could come out so they would have to be better informed as they make their short-term decisions. So you have shared some of this with me, so, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be help, help, hopefully kind of walk us through this a little bit, but um, you, you talked about the, the level of uncertainty and, and you said we never had a more uncertain time than that. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on, on that? Or what, what are the pieces of the uncertainty that sure. make this so volatile? And, and, and what, what would, should people be trying to see firm up as soon as they can to, to make better choices? Well, there are two fundamental sets of uncertainty. The, dyna the, the biological dynamics of the virus itself, and then the economic and political response to it. Okay, so let's talk about the dynamics of the virus. How quickly does it spread? How severe is it? Who is affected? Big question. Is there immunity that comes from it? Uh, is there a second wave coming? Uh, and, and is it one wave or multiple waves? Uh, does it mutate? All of these are sources of uncertainty on the dynamics of the virus. Related to that is, do we develop a uh, cure? Do we develop a vaccine? Do we develop a test for antibodies to tell us who is immune and so on? So there's a whole set of uh, uncertainties around the virus itself and the direct bio biology, cures, etc. And all of those questions are still up for grabs. We don't know. And it shapes very strongly uh, what is likely to happen. 
right? So that's one set of uncertainties. The second set of uncertainties have to do with the political, economic, and social responses. <clears throat> and what we've seen is an enormous amount of variation. You've seen the companies, countries that were hit first, China, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, all of whom moved very aggressively and mostly quite successfully so far. And I have to say so far, because we don't know yet what happens as they begin to relax their controls. But so far, they've shown a very clear uh, uh, response. Then you get Europe, United States, and elsewhere. And there, uh, Europe is going in different directions. We've had Italy and Spain, a complete catastrophe. We had UK go one way, then the other way. Uh, so, you know, and Sweden and the Netherlands are taking a completely different approach. They're letting everybody get the disease. So we'll see what happens. Uh, and then the United States, we have essentially almost nothing happening at the federal level and a great deal, but highly variable, happening at the state level. So California moved fast, uh, mostly got it right, it looks like, and is actually seeing the beginning of some effect. Meanwhile, the governor of uh, Mississippi said, hey, I believe Trump, but I don't believe the experts. I believe Rush when he tells me don't believe the doctors. So all you guys that, who are sheltering at home, forget it. Go back to work. Uh, and so uh, the governor of Mississippi is telling people, no problem. Don't worry about it. And so what we're seeing is a huge variation between the red states and the blue states. Blue states believe the experts. The red states believe Trump. And so what we have is an enormous variation in the response around the country. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing is actually people still believing this is a hoax, uh, you know, and it's a Democrats trying to undermine Trump. So it has become highly politicized. It's become a partisan issue. Well, is that variation, I mean, aside from the red state, you know, denial of that, but the variation from Europe and, and Asia and here, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or would you rather see a homogenous way to deal with this or, or more kind of uh, heterogeneous Neither. I'd ways rather see collaboration and sharing. Okay. Um, and, and, and we are not today. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, in this morning's Financial Times, there's a superb article by Martin Wolf on the need and dynamics of collaboration. I highly recommend it. It's in the opinion section. Um, mm -hmm. But it makes the point that, you know, we really do need to collaborate in a lot of ways, and we're not collaborating at all. We're actually fighting it out. Uh, we're blaming them. They're blaming us. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, we, we don't see it. So you see different responses, highly variable in a variety of places. And we'll see different outcomes as a result. So, okay, so we got a ton of, uh, when you say, maybe it was just hyperbole, but when you say we've never seen this amount of uncertainty, is it in your experience that this is just, just a really an amazing kind of historical anomaly or something? Oh, yeah. Or you, no, it's like a war. You know, it's like if you were sitting there in, uh, on December 8th of 1941, you'd be looking at the future and say, wow, it is really uncertain. You know, are we going to be fighting out the Japanese, the Nazis? What's going to happen domestically? It's be pretty uncertain. Well, we're there. It's December 8th, 1941. Uh, it's the day after Pearl Harbor. Uh, and we said, oh, my God. I mean, we really don't know. I mean, you think about just a very big one. What's going to happen with the U.S. election? Right? Uh, mm -hmm. There is an election going on. We're going to elect every member of Congress, uh, of the House. We're going to elect a third of the Senate. And, oh, by the way, there's this presidential candidate. I seem to have forgotten his name, Joe something or other, uh, who was running for president. Uh, uh, you know, could we have Joe disappear and, you know, uh, uh, what's uh, uh, Cuomo, who's been doing an amazing job on TV, suddenly the, they draft Cuomo as the candidate. If I'd said to you two months ago, Andrew Cuomo will be the pres next president of the United States, that would have seemed an absolutely nutso scenario, but it doesn't today. <laughs> okay, Maxim says, uh, sorry. so let's move to the next thing. Now, you, you, again, I'm kind of thinking how you worked out these scenarios a little <laughs> bit. You talked about the dif difference between a short-term scenario and the kind of aftermath of the crisis. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about when you talk short-term scenarios, um, how do you start thinking about that and how do you, what's the medium-term kind of way, uh, a little bit about how your thinking came together with your group. You, you, you well, if you think more. about scenarios as a decision-making environment, a context for decision-making. So not surprisingly, when you're in crisis, you're really concerned about the, you know, the, the immediate, the very short run. You know, it's the old line about uh, being up to your ass in alligators in the swamp. You're not too worried about draining the swamp. You're running from alligators. Well, we're running from alligators. Let's be very clear. 
you know, we're trying to get up the healthcare system. We're trying to get up testing. There's, you know, if, if I, I'm in fairly frequent contact with uh, Gavin Newsom and Jerry Brown, and I can tell you, you know, uh, yes, they're worried about the long term, but hour by hour, they're trying to can we get ventilators out? Can we get doctors going? Can you know, you're in crisis mode. And so uh, the decision-making environment for the near future, and the important question, how long we will be in crisis mode. And so that's one of the uncertainties. Are we gonna be in it for three months, six months, 18 months? We don't know. Will the short-term crisis persist you know, when the, when the disease uncertainty begins to lift? So for example, if the summer months begin, begins to lead to a rapid decline in the number of new cases, Will that now say, all right, we can begin to get out of the crisis mode and start thinking about the aftermath? Or if not, if the number of cases continues to rise and so on, we may still be in a crisis mode six months, a year, 18 months from now. It really depends on that. But when you're in the crisis mode, it's really about alligators. Let's be clear. All right. Mm -hmm. Then toward the end of that, you begin to think about, all right, how do I look at the, uh, the upturn? Is this going to be uh, a, a fairly gradual return? Is this going to be a long, uh, a kind of slow recovery or a really long depression, right? Again, we don't know what the outcome of the kind of economic disruption is likely to be. And you would do different things depending upon which of those things you believe. You know, if it's a re recovery from a normal recession, it's one thing. If it's rebuilding from a depression, it's another thing. So, uh, that comes into play. And then finally, you start asking yourself the question in the long run, uh, uh, that is, you know, what does that world look like out there? You know, how much has it changed in a fundamental way? Here, you and I are interacting by video, you know, over Zoom. Well, is Zoom the great company of the 21st century that everybody is now interacting with uh, uh, real time? You know, because Zoom works so well, you know, and do we change our mode of communication and work, et cetera, and medicine and lettering and, and all of that because of what we've learned. So there's a lot of, you know, kind of cumulative uncertainties. How long does the uh, uh, crisis mode last? When does the aftermath begin? What are the dynamics of that aftermath? And then how much has changed after all? Now, what I did see of the of the of the some of the material you, you shared with me, um, you were thinking short term is more like two to four quarters. Uh, aftermath is like eighteen months to as well as long as three years. Right, uh, and, and and that's the way to think about that. And then long term, when you think about those long term scenarios, which we'll get to, are more like the, coming off the next decade kind of thing. Exactly, is that, is that the, three to five years. More like three to five years. Three to five years is the long is the long term thing. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that's good to know. Um, so one of the things I'm going to try to push a little bit here, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, because you're kind of giving this, you know, range of, oh, it could be Great Depression, could be a thing. So, so let's, let's say um, you, you did kind of play a little bit with what's the best case scenario. So, so why don't you, since that's the happiest, or, or at least one that people can relate to quicker, um, talk, talk about what, what, what that looks like and, and what's its probability at some point. The, the upside of all of this is, okay, we, you know, we get the responses right, we organize ourselves quickly, and the disease is not as terrible as we think, i.e., it, it fades with the weather and doesn't come back for a second attack, right? That's the best case, right? So come summer, June, we're seeing a rapid decline in cases, rapid decline of hospitalization, et cetera, and people start going back to work call it June, July, right? And the economy begins to recover. Best case is that, in fact, there's so much pent up demand, we've provided enough income that we now see a fairly rapid takeoff in the economy in the second half of the year. Not likely, but that is plausible. That's the best case, right? And that, that depends upon managing the disease well. That happens, that's, you know, would be called something like a V-shaped economic recovery, right? Deep dive, come back relatively quickly. And that means by this time next year, things would be getting back to normal, call it, you know, so things would be. So it would still take all the way from, from a V-shaped June, you think it would still take a year to get back to what we think of as normal. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a pretty deep dive. We're tearing things apart, getting the logistics going again, getting transport and travel going. You know, travel, uh, transportation is 10% of the world. Uh, you know, we're shutting it all down, you know, firing that back up, getting the airlines back up. There's going to be massive consolidation, even in the best case. 
And then the, the interesting question is, uh, what of the behaviors and norms that we've developed in the crisis persist? There's a, you know, uh, I, I was in touch with the governor on Saturday and I was talking about the aftermath and saying, look, at the end of the uh, crisis as it begins to come along, you need to give a speech, which I'm calling the new California. Uh, because it's going to be a different California coming out of it, even in a short-term crisis. And that is, we've learned a lot. We kind of, you know, I'm looking out, I live up in the Berkeley Hills, the freeway is normal, is, is almost empty, the air is clear, my neighbors are walking in the neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, I'm spending more time with my wife. Uh, maybe people like spending time with their family, not commuting, uh, uh, not seeing traffic, seeing cleaner air, all of those kinds of things. How much of that do we want to protect and preserve? Um, how much do we want to capture? Uh, kids are learning in new ways in school. Collaborate, maybe some of that we want to capture. I'm looking out at the Salesforce Tower across the bay and it's empty. Do I still need that tower? Um, you know, there's those kinds of interesting questions about how we rebuild our lives coming out of this that offer us an opportunity to reinvent in a very positive way. So that's the best case scenario. You did say it was hot, unlikely, though. Is there any way to quantify that or even give no. some kind of sense of like... No. Uh... I, I won't put any numbers on it. <laughs> I don't do that. If you do that, what happens is people focus on what they think is the most likely and forget about the other scenarios. So in good scenario planning, you never put probabilities on it. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So, so let's, let's, with that in mind, we'll maybe circle back to that a little bit of what do you do? Uh, but let's, let's go to the, let's go to the worst case, just out of, just to kind of counter that. I mean, what you just laid out is still extremely disruptive. We're waiting on next oh, week. Yeah. So, so, and without being super, well, I, I shouldn't qualify. Just what's a worst case scenario that we got to. Well, the worst case is a depression worse than the 1930s. That's the, the worst case. Yeah, because look, we're tearing the whole world economy apart. You know, even the Russians have begun to respond. Uh, you know, literally, we're uh, uh, breaking all the supply lines. We're breaking all of the kind of uh, uh, operational dynamics of the world. Putting it back together is going to be a big challenge. And if we have a high death rate, we're going to lose a lot of talent, a lot of people, a lot of capabilities. Uh, uh, just to take a simple example, a painful one. There's an aircraft carrier in Guam right now with a lot of illness on board, a lot of coronavirus, okay? They want to move those people offshore or to Guam. Well, there aren't any spare people on an aircraft carrier. Everybody has an important job, right? Uh, well, a lot of those jobs are going to go unfilled uh, very shortly on that aircraft carrier. So you think about our society, it's like that aircraft carrier. We're going to have a lot of jobs that are not filled for a long time. Uh, uh, jobs in banks, jobs in government, jobs in uh, education, um, and so on. Uh, that professor who was teaching your course who just died or can't go back to work, you know. Uh, so in the worst case, we've so disrupted it, it takes a long time to put it back together. And on top of which, a lack of collaboration among countries. Conflict. How did, world, how did the Great Depression end? World War II. Let's be clear. That's what ended the depression, not economic policy. Uh, we went into a second wave of the depression in 1937 and only building the war machine got us out of that. And then keeping a sustained war machine for the Cold War kept us out of it. Well, what are we gonna do now? Uh, and an important question is we've done a short-term uh, fill-in economically. That is that the bill that was passed by the Congress is not a stimulus bill. It is a bill to fill in the economic hole that was created by the crisis. There is nothing in there that builds for the long run. So big question coming is, do we actually do what is necessary to rebuild? And given the right wing philosophy that we are libertarian and the government should do the least possible, it is very likely that we'll see high degree of differentiation. Some states like California will move aggressively to rebuild. Other states like, say, Texas or Louisiana or Mississippi or Alabama will say, or Georgia will say, nah, it's up to the private sector to get back to it. We don't care. <clears throat> and so we will see a high degree of differentiation in the responses here and around the world as well. So in a long scenario, you see very poor economics, high growth of poverty, high growth of conflict, fighting it out over precious supplies. 
uh, <clears throat> disruption of, say, supply lines for oil and gas, shortages, etc. This is an ugly scenario. Does it necessary? I'm hearing what you're saying, and without <laughs> kind of going too deep into that <coughs> negative direction, but um, you're not necessarily you, when, when you say it ended, the, the Great Depression ended with war. It, indeed, it did. But that doesn't mean you have to end up in war to build no. out of these things. I mean, no. it, it's a, there is a scenario where you could imagine a similar kind of mobilization of society, of resources, of directed kind of effort, i.e. solve climate change, other things, you know, that could do it as well. Well, yeah, look, right. I'm seeing a lot at, at a, a kind of grassroots level, as it were, in the neighborhood, in the community, and so on. I see it at the state level. Where I see it uh, failing is at national governments, China's national government, our national government, Japan's national government, uh, the British national government. So national governments are doing an exceptionally poor job in many places uh, in terms of dealing, with the exceptions of Singapore, Taiwan, maybe Korea, uh, pretty much everywhere else. Um, many, uh, not Germany, uh, Angela Merkel is getting it right. She's one of the only European leaders who's really stood up. So we're seeing a general failure of politics uh, and a real success at the grassroots level. When you say China didn't get it right, I know, I know initially they, they bumbled it, but would you say they're still not getting it right? They seem to have kind of flattened the curve, as they say, and are starting to get people back working. Don't know it's yet. Too soon to tell. My son lives in Beijing, so I have a kind of constant flow of information for my son, Ben. He's a game designer for a Chinese game company coming to the U.S., and he went through the lockdown. Uh, he was at home eating on uh, 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 you know, delivered food uh, and trying to design the game remotely with his team. It was okay, but now they're back to work. Uh, the restaurants are open. The streets aren't quite yet full. People are still wearing masks and so on, but they're getting back to it. And that will be fine if there's no second wave. Uh, if there's a second wave, everything that they've just released could turn out to be catastrophically awful because now they will start moving people around and people who may still be infected that they don't know. So we just don't know what's going to play out in China. And China clearly has backed off. They're not maintaining the level of control. As compared to Singapore, which has gotten even tighter, not less. They're keeping much tighter control. Now, Singapore's tiny, you know, it's 5 million people. But they, they're taking seriously the likelihood of a second wave. Uh, and uh, they're maintaining very tight control. So uh, I, I would not say yet China is out of the, uh, you know, out of danger by any means. Got you. Now, you use this word, um, what, what would it take to get back to, to looking normal. You, you said there's several things we should be looking for to get to normal. Could, could you kind of help people think about those? No, this really came things? from Larry Brilliant, who's one of the great epidemiologists. But, you know, the first is, as I said, uh, when does the... Wait, was uh, he involved in your, in your scenario? Yeah, he, well, he reviewed them. He, he commented on them. Uh, okay, and, and he basically agreed with what we were saying. Uh, but basically, uh, what, what needs to happen is, first of all, what's going to happen with the, the, the disease itself. So that's one thing. The second is cures uh, and treatments. And, and the third is then the long-term cyclical nature of it. Uh, these are things we just don't know. It needs to be non-cyclical. We need to have cures, and it needs to die down. Uh, we need to have uh, you know, tight controls everywhere. If those don't happen, uh, then it, like it, it, if, for example, the state of Mississippi becomes a hot spot and starts spreading it back into the country, the, the, the governor of Mississippi can screw the whole country. Hmm. Okay. And then, but isn't there even a more technical way to think of it that, that, that we need uh, to understand, to be able to test people, to see yes. if people are immune, yes. Yes. and also to get a vaccine? If, I mean, those, those are yes. kind of free scientific exactly. almost exactly. things we need, right? Yes. In your understanding and having done the, 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 the scenario process you did, um, what's the best case of thinking of those? I mean, I know sometimes they say vaccines might take 18 months, but could we accelerate these things to get them more like six months or something quicker? Well, uh, in fact, Bill Gates was asked that question yesterday, and, and his guess was you might be able to get it down to a year. Uh, you know, I've been a director of a cancer research company. I have a pretty good idea what it takes to bring a drug to market. Uh, and, and I, you know, as much as people want to bring drugs to market, the, the, the truth of the matter is that safety and efficacy are two uh, very subtle questions. And, you know, you can bring a drug to market that is worse than uh, the, the disease itself. Uh, think about thalidomide, for example, which was given to uh, pregnant women 
as a tranquilizer and that produced a whole generation of birth defects. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the cost of getting it wrong can be catastrophically high. Um, mm -hmm. And we just don't know. So, you, you, I mean, the first thing you have to figure out is, does this thing do anything? Is it safe? And then secondly, and finally, does it actually uh, help people uh, get well? And so even at the most accelerated pace, uh, you're saying Gates or, or some other people you maybe hear um, are saying a year. So we're not, we might be able to shave half a third of it off from an 18 month process to kind of a year. The, the thing that is going to happen, and you can see it already, is that it was called off-label. That is, uh, uh, lots of people are going to start experimenting with known drugs that have effects on similar kinds of diseases. Uh, and that's what Trump went public with, and now several people have died uh, as a result of taking drugs that Trump said were okay. Uh, Dr. Trump, and his famous degree is in medicine, uh, was mm -hmm. informing people of what he thinks as opposed to what the doctors think. Uh, yeah. And of course, now people are dying as a result of following his advice. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Darwin at work. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's move. I mean, I'm just trying to cover all this turf and then we can, we can uh, talk about a few other things. But um, the longer term scenarios, I, I know for people that don't understand scenarios, there's often a kind of way to kind of sum up a scenario, uh, and often they come in fours. Um, but I know you guys came up with four. Is that something you can talk to us a little bit about, sure. about the collection you came up with? Um, uh, maybe, I think the first one was return to status quo, or like, so talk about, well, I guess of, that's, we talked a little bit about that, but yeah. say what that would be. Well, that, that, that's sort of like what we call kind of the silver lining scenario, right? Where the world actually comes out in a better place at the end of the day. Right, that, that we, uh, we've learned a lot, uh, we've built up systems, there's a lot of collaboration, et cetera. You know, th this happens, this can happen coming out of a war. Um, uh, you know, you think about uh, the, what happened after World War II uh, in the US and Europe and so on. Lots of collaboration, we built a whole new world order coming out of that. That's the best case. However, there are other possibilities. Uh, the other possibilities, for example, are uh, the rise of the East. U.S., Europe, confused, chaotic, loses their way. China is already beginning to reach out to help the rest of the world. Uh, th they're learning from Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. And coming out of this, we see a wholesale shift. And if you think about World War I as one of those cases where that led to that kind of change. Prior to World War I, the dominant powers were Germany, the French, the British, World War I ended that. Coming out of it, it was the United States was the dominant party, right? Britain spent so much money, killed so many people. The French, same thing, same with the Germans. They all fell behind. And now it was the U.S. and the U.S. dollar that began to dominate the world. Well, this could be one of those moments. The Chinese yuan, the Chinese the billion and a quarter Chinese people begin to take on a new role in the world. Whereas America, led by a protectionist, isolationist, nationalist, in the form of Donald Trump, says, fuck you to the rest of the world. Uh, and he's done that. And so the U.S. retreats and China rises. So that becomes another, uh, I think, very plausible scenario coming out of here. Okay, so there's the New World Order. And then you also mentioned one about global friction of kind of populism rising and stuff. Sure. Could you talk uh, a little this, bit about this, that scenario? Yeah, yeah again, this kind of re uh, uh, is that world that we saw prior to the crisis beginning to happen. You saw the rising, we clearly have had populist national leaders in the United States, the UK, uh, Italy, Spain, uh, uh, competing in successfully in France, the rise of the extreme right in uh, uh, Germany, uh, uh, attempts in the Netherlands and Sweden. So what we're uh, definitely in Poland and uh, Hungary. Uh, so what we've seen in the West is this rise of right-wing populism uh, 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 in many places. Uh, it won here in the U.S. and it could persist. Trump could get reelected. Johnson could be around for a while. Uh, you can imagine Le Pen taking over from Macron. Uh, AFD in Germany, and suddenly what you've got is uh, uh, right-wing populist governments in many places, uh, uh, all competing against each other, a, a world of very high friction. So more like the nationalists, lock the borders, exactly. do it alone, yeah. America per se. Now, now again, I know you, you can't put percentages per se or, or weight them, but um, 
if you if you take the difference between let's say that global friction scenario where the po rise of populism and nationalism, but the kind of I guess your silver lining a kind of version would be a kind of return uh, and then even an acceleration of more global coordination and more kind of uh, you know the liberal democracies of of the West also kind of resurgent. Um, is there any way to weight those or to think, no. you know, is it a 50-50 a jump ball or is it a kind of a trending in any kind of well, direction? Well, yeah, well, right now you'd have to say where it's trending toward is uh, toward the uh, rise of the East and the decline of the West. Mm -hmm. um, China's mostly getting it. Yeah, China's getting it more right than we are. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese, the Asian powers are getting it more right. India, you know, as soon as they figured out what was going on, locked down the whole country. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, not so true in the U.S. We still don't have a national lockdown in the United States. The idiot refuses. Uh, you know, uh, he wanted to open the country next weekend. Um, finally, you know, Fauci convinced him, don't do that. Um, but so, you know, we are not yet coordinated here in the U.S. So, it's, and, and we are certainly not helping anybody in the rest of the world. Um, and uh, so uh, clearly this is a moment of U.S. retreat and decline, disruption and failure. Uh, and China is taking a public and, and global role, sending supplies to other countries, sending doctors to other countries, uh, trying to help from their experience. Uh, so uh, China is recognizing this moment of historic shift and moving aggressively to take advantage of it. Got you. Okay. Now, so, they may not um, succeed. Let me say, they could fail. I, I'm not saying that that scenario is inevitable because they could still screw up. They don't, they, they are not yet really masters of their own fate. Totally got you. Um, okay. So, uh, and, and by the way, there was another scenario in there which we kind of rushed over, but, it, you know, so, so there was this kind of sense of the new world order uh, with China kind of more dominant, uh, kind of an Asia-centric shift. Uh, there was this global friction, which is rise of populism and empowerment of that, and you keep going down that work. There was your kind of silver lining, which I guess you're saying uh, it kind of, I would say that would be more like the, the more integrated global world that kind of yeah. works, collaborates yeah. together. But there was a return to the status quo. I mean, that ain't going to happen. It, it, we're past but, that point. Oh, really? Okay, so, so see more about that, because I did see one of the four was, hey, we, we could actually go back and, you know, we're, we're back doing what we're doing, kind of thing. No, I think we've passed that point. Uh, say, they, say it's one of the that. scenarios that will disappear. There's no return to where we were. That scenario is gone. Literally in just the last few weeks, you think it's yeah. shifted yeah. that dramatically. Yeah, exactly. Because just how severe this has been, how, how clearly it's, yeah. it's disrupted. The recession is going to be worse than we thought at the beginning or than was possible at the beginning. Uh, the disruption is greater and the adaptation is also greater. In a positive way, you're saying? Yeah, is that yeah, right? yeah, exactly. So there is no going back to the old days thing. Yeah, okay. we're not gonna go back to the way we worked, learned, shop before. Well, or okay, so, so, Excuse me, what was that? Or governed. Or governed, okay, okay, well, let's say, say, say more about, um, that I mean, so one way to think about it is, um, uh, what are the things? Say more about that. What What do you think that well, the most already obvious, now we're gonna we're, we're it's no turning back on a few of these things. Well, I mean, just think about uh, the election. I mean, are are we going to have paper ballots? People going to the polls and voting on November, whatever the date of the election is this year. I think it's unlikely. Question. How will we conduct a national election in November? How will the Democrats hold a convention when they can't get 10,000 people together in a hall? How will they select their candidate? Um, uh, these are open questions yet. Um, and so there's, I think, an enormous uncertainty about government and governance. About how we shift. Um... But what you're also saying, I guess, from no turning back, you're saying, and and once we do virtualize that, or once we do, you know, vote by mail, everybody, you're saying a we're lot of these things back. are not going to. Yeah, we're not going. It, back. Yeah. yeah, no. If it, uh, Oregon already has a hundred percent remote voting, mostly electronic, mostly online, right? All right. So we're going to go. I think we're going to do something like that nationally. We're going to be forced to do that. 
And then, of course, you also have then the wrinkle that one of the things we have not talked about is that this is also, uh, Trump has called himself a wartime president, uh, but it is actually a war, but not just against the coronavirus. It's also very clear that the Russians and the Chinese are trying to disrupt the United States actively with cyber measures. So they're, they're intervening, providing false information, false data, all kinds of things to public officials. Um, so we have to sort out uh, fake reality from real reality, including the official fake reality from the Trump White House. So we've got the official fake reality, the unofficial fake reality coming from the Russians and Chinese. So institutions are horribly confused. And so we're seeing all kinds of fake information coming in, in an active disinformation campaign, especially from the Russians, but the Chinese have joined as well. And so it is not at all clear that we can conduct a coherent election. And so there's an enormous amount of uncertainty about this. Mostly because what would happen in that election could make a huge difference on, on the course of the, of, of the country, America's. Uh, and the world. You know, look, the, the Russians won the last election in the United States and put their guy in place. And he's done all kinds of things to help them along, including currently by really harming the country in his response. So, you know, he's carrying out Putin's work every day uh, and doing enormous damage. Now imagine an election that gets even less legitimacy. The last election was illegitimate. The next one will be even less legitimate. Or could be, not necessarily, or, or are, you, are you saying- I'm saying, wrong? look, if we go paper, we're not gonna have enough people vote. If we go electronic, the Russians are gonna disrupt it. So there's no good scenario for the election. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Um, Okay, we're let's get to we're going to circle back to politics in a minute here, but let, let's let's do a couple things with um, a little bit of uh, a, a couple things I want to also go on here because uh, to fill this out a bit. One of the things we talk about in uh, scenarios uh, are the driving forces. Are these things that are kind of long-term technology trends or demographic trends or all these things that shape the future in ways that you can kind of get some um, coherent way to think forward about it. Uh, in, in ways that people don't often think about. Um, in many respects, uh, when you think about the driving forces that were in motion through the last year, the last few years, um, do you see this disruption, uh, some of them, like the digitization of everything, uh, the kind of um, connectivity of everybody, the, uh, you know, the growth of AI, you know, the our understanding of biological systems. I mean, there's a lot of things that are happening in our world here that not only won't go away, but could be accelerated. I mean, could, could you talk a little bit about what this crisis, you know, how, how these forces kind of get accelerated or dampened a little bit, and what ones do you think will actually be accelerated to some extent? Well, uh, so I think the scientific and technological forces that have been underway for a long time are going to continue. We're still going to see advances in AI. We're going to see advances in molecular biology, all the kinds of things that we, we've been seeing. That's going to continue, right? Uh, I think I, I, I'm not too worried. In fact, it, it is very likely that the crisis will accelerate some of those. We'll need more use of AI. We'll need new biology. So, uh, you know, just like wartime accelerates science and technology, this will too. So, mm -hmm. you know, if th these things were moving along, they're likely to get a, a, a kick. More resources, more people, more talent devoted to them. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, um, and things like, you know, using what we're doing here at Zoom, uh, more, uh, better tools for collaboration, better tools for remote engagement, all of those kinds of things that were uh, uh, moving uh, already. You know, uh, most of my calls in recent years have been video calls. Well, now they're all video calls and including we have cocktails with friends, etc. So there's all of those kinds of technological phenomena that I think are very real. I think one of the most interesting things, of course, was that prior to the crisis, we were already in this moment of beginning to challenge globalization, right, uh, with the trade crisis that Trump induced. Uh, and we were seeing challenges to the global supply lines. Uh, uh, already prior to the crisis. So it's very likely that the crisis will now take what was a short-term set of driving forces that were breaking the old long-term globalization forces and accelerate that break. Uh, mm. So, you know, we, we had already, be, you know, if we were going this way toward globalization and begun to tip over, this will accelerate that. So you think we're going to move 
many elements of manufacturing out of China, say back to the United States, right? Because we can no longer rely on global supply chains, right? And, and that will make things more costly and so on. Uh, so there are those kinds of phenomena that are... Well, okay, so, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but, but could you imagine though that also the seriousness of this global crisis and the idea that we can see how something that uh, comes out of China, you know, four months ago, can really shut down your whole economy. Couldn't you imagine a kind of level of heightened global coordination or uh, to, to kind of a more collective response to this saying, hey, yeah, there was some feedback against, you know, yes, and that required, that, but sure. we need to kind of figure it out how to get forward, not backwards on this stuff. Yes, kind of and that requires a change of leadership. Uh, that is, uh, look, at, at Davos last year, not this past, not this current year, last year, uh, we had a serious conversation of what it would take to kind of get the world going again. And there was universal agreement that, because we were already drifting into fragmentation and conflict. Uh, the, as a result, uh, we came to the conclusion that it was going to take real major new leadership. And the only way you got that was a massive crisis, World War II being the perfect example, right? So out of World War II, you get Churchill, Truman, Roosevelt, Eisenhower, you know, uh, de Gaulle, people like that, you know, leading the world coming out of uh, the, 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 the war. So a question, do we get those kinds of people rising? Do we get somebody who rises as a result of the crisis? Andrew Cuomo becomes president of the United States instead of Joe Biden, who Joe's a sweetie, but it's hard to imagine him as the inspiring leader of the future, his old grandpa, rather than driving force for creating the future. The, the crucial question is, do we get out of the crisis a new generation of leaders Gavin Newsom doing a spectacular job in California, you know. Uh, so we're seeing a new generation maybe beginning to rise of young leaders uh, who really take a global view and take us in the right direction. China has a challenge in that respect. Hard to replace Xi Jinping. Does Xi change and rise to the challenge? Mm. Not much so far. Uh, so I think that's the really big question. Does the crisis induce an adequate response of great new leadership to lead us coming out of this into rebuilding a better world faster? That's interesting. Leadership. Um, well, as long as we're there, let's just say one more thing on this, on the California piece. Uh, we're both sitting in California here. We've both been here for many years. Um, we're both kind of been watching this closely. Um, Given this, I mean, you know, 40 million people, fifth largest economy in the world, you know, frankly, a lot of uh, alignment now in politics. There's not a lot of uh, conflict like there had been a decade ago between the parties and all. There's a kind of an open running field a little bit here. And you do have a set of, uh, Gavin, and also he's plugged the government with very capable people, as we all know. In fact, I think you, you don't you serve on his... Uh, Future Work Commission? Is yes, I do. I'm a member of what's called the California Commission on the Future of Work, which, uh, interestingly enough, of course, now needs to think, rethink its agenda. We were put together thinking about the future of automation and AI and all those kinds of things and what's going to happen to jobs. Well, jobs are, about, are already disrupted. And so the commission is actually slightly on pause as we're rethinking our conclusions and trying to examine what the longer term implications, just as we talked about a little while ago, of the virus are for work for business organization, et cetera. But so, so picking, up, picking up on that, you know, a competent government and again, a different set of leaders. Could you imagine that there would be a kind of a um, much more federalist kind of decentralized response to what's going on here in America and, and in fact, California and potentially other states taking the lead and, and yes. actually becoming uh, re really- Yeah, it, well, it's and, happening. And it isn't, we don't have to imagine it, it's happening. Look, the libertarians, uh, uh, you know, uh, David Koch went public and said, look, the federal government shouldn't be doing much here. This is up to the states. Um, uh, they're, they're putting a lot of pressure. You know, here's the right wing on Trump not to do anything, uh, that leave it to the states. And that's what's happening, you know. Uh, and Trump says, if you're nice to me, I might help. But if you're not nice, you know, that governor of Michigan and that governor of California, I don't like those guys. We're not going to help those states. Will. You know, so basically what we have is a negative federal government and a positive set of many states, not all. We have idiots like the governor of Mississippi uh, and Alabama uh, and others uh, who have clearly gotten it wrong, mostly in the South, uh, you know, uh, Darwin at work. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Well, look at okay. So, so let's shift a couple of last things. So, so um, driving forces. You mentioned the globalization thing. What about the tech clash? Again, another thing that's been oh, brewing yeah, just the last few years. But now tech is getting so central to this solution, and it's very kind of solution oriented. It's very quick to, and it's you know a vital kind of response here. Do you think there's a kind of a recalibration of that? And do you think that's going to shift? It's a very important question, Pete. I'm I'm actually working on a big project that has a major issue here. Exactly the right question. Uh, I'm leading a project for Salesforce to deploy rapidly uh, 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 case tracking software, right? That enables you if you find somebody who's sick, who did they have contact with? Uh, and using cell phones to either track locations or people. Well, there are important privacy implications of that. And immediately, as soon as we said, all right, here's a solution to finding the disease, the privacy adequate activists said, wait a minute. No, 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 no. You might reveal somebody. Uh, and uh, now, as it happens, the applications have been the two that are kind of competitive, one from Singapore and one from MIT, different approaches. One uses uh, Bluetooth, one uses GPS, doesn't that much matter. Each are built around the idea of protecting privacy. Are they perfect? Not at all. Are they essential? Absolutely. Are they being deployed in Singapore? Yes. In the United States? No. Uh, hmm. Because the privacy folks have immediately put up their hands and said, wait a minute, not so sure. We have to do a full assessment of how this be. And, and they're going to do that. And eventually we'll get around to deploying it long after many people have died. Um, and so I, I'm wrestling with my own privacy people at Salesforce meeting tonight uh, uh, to look at, can we deploy this or are the damage to our reputation so huge that we can't afford to deploy the technology? And just for those that are watching this, I, I, just because I know a little something what you're saying there, what, what you're talking about there is uh, the, uh, the ability through cell phones to understand who someone who does get this virus, who they have been in contact with and be able to trace that back quickly, right? Is well, there the are two saying? different approaches. One is with Bluetooth. If you and I both have the software on our phone and we go near it within six feet, it will send me a signal. Hey, you're next to somebody who's got a disease or you were worse. If, if I, if I uh, get it, I can then, uh, the authorities can then send back to everybody who was near me, hey, you were near Schwartz and he has the disease. The alternate approach is using GPS. I, they would track your movements and when people determine, hey, that supermarket, there were people who were affected and you went through that supermarket, they'll let you know. So they're, they're, they're different in their approach. They're both aiming to protect the privacy of the individual. In both cases, no data ever leaves the phone uh, it, unless the person is infected and needs to share that information. So there's a hard work to protect the privacy, but neither of them is perfect. And as a result, what we're seeing is a lot of opposition, despite the fact that people are going to die. I, I can imagine another scenario here is that people are going to get more open to uh, less privacy to be more safe in the future. I, I would, Which I, I think is the likely outcome over the long run. I, I think uh, when people start dying because the privacy addict said you can't share information, you can't share data on disease results, you can't share, share early results of drug trials, or we're going to get a lot of willingness to share information. Agreed. Um, but the general thing, you kind of, we went down that hole there, but do you see, uh, just like the backlash against globalization, the backlash against technology, it feels to me like that's, there's a more oh, yeah, credible right. scenario yeah, that, that, that tech will kind of redeem itself or could redeem itself. Obviously. Well, what hopes, but, but because there was low trust going into this crisis, we have, mm -hmm. we're climbing out of a hole. We're not starting on the surface, Right. Uh, the uh, the public does not trust the industry. So if Google comes forward and says, hey, we've got a good way to uh, identify everybody who's ill, everybody's going to freak out immediately. Or Facebook does the same. Everybody's going to freak out. Look what's happening to the Amazon reactions and so on. So these, are, you know, the countries are, the country is starting in a hole in their trust. Uh, we had mm -hmm. a trust crisis going in. Now we need their trust and we don't have it. So it'll be hard to deploy. We've had a trust problem with tech. We had a trust problem with global kind of other countries, and we got a trust problem with government. We're we're in a kind of a trust deficit here yes. at a time when you need trust of everybody basically to keep moving forward. Yep. Um, well, look at with the remaining time here we have here. Um, one of the things we said about scenarios it helps you understand kind of what's out there, or at least think more rigorously about what's out there. 
if you were to kind of give just general advice to, you know, people running businesses, people, you know, you know, folks who are running their own organizations, but also just working in different places, trying to understand the strategic landscape better. Are there any thoughts you have on, on ways to start thinking about this and, and, sure. and what you might start doing? What, what's some advice here? Well, it's the advice I give my own management. And, and that is, look, I mean, first of all, you got to survive in the short run. You got to deal with the crisis, right? So uh, uh, make sure you don't do anything stupid in the crisis that makes it harder later on, right? But <clears throat> essentially pay attention to the crisis as long as we are deep in the thick of it. That's number one. Take care of your people, take care of your family, take care of life. Secondly, when it becomes clear to you personally that things are beginning to look up, that the crisis is beginning to unwind, now you want to start thinking about your next steps. How are you going to play in that near environment with your job, with your family, your kids' education, etc.? There'll still be big uncertainties in that phase. And then finally, what are those things you want to take advantage of? The opportunities that have been created, new ways of working, new ways of learning, new ways of collaboration, and so on. Uh, and start thinking about how you can build a better future coming out of that. There's every reason to, you know, uh, there's this software called Neighborhood, right? Or Next Door, no, Next Door, right? Yeah. So Gavin is using that to uh, engage with lots of people around the state. An old GBN network, Nirav Talib, started that company, the network yeah. member. Uh, and, uh, you know, the opportunity to collaborate in the neighborhood may be a huge uh, new phenomenon, neighbors getting to know neighbors and collaborating with each other in new ways, learning together, uh, and so on. So I, I, I think there's an opportunity to shape a better future coming out of it if we get it right in the right time. So I know, I know you're an optimist, as I am, um, and this is a little trying time for a lot of optimists, but um, uh, what, what gives you hope that, that actually uh, we can take this situation and um, and really do build a different, uh, better world coming off this. And that this is, I mean, because in some ways, you know, we were on this status quo thing. It was hard to get big changes. People were ignoring climate change. People were ignoring inequality. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that was happening. It was starting to bubble up, but it really wasn't like, how are we really going to shift? And now it's like, boom, the old system collapses. And like, there is this opportunity to build a new thing. I agree. Um, Look, what, what, I, what do you, say more about what you think about that and what gives well, you hope I, about Two it. different levels. At the first level, uh, what I see happening at the neighborhood, community, family level, how much uh, kind of interpersonal support, just walking in the neighborhood, people smiling at each other, you know, that, mm -hmm. that sense uh, of, of people helping each other, the neighbor who goes to the store for the older person who can't go, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. So just a lot of kind of self-help uh, at a very community level. It's been a long time since we had to do anything like that. You know, really the Great Depression was the last time that we had to do anything like that, where it was neighbor helping neighbor. Uh, and I think that's very, very, very important, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, it creates a very different context of mutual support and intimacy and caring. We're not isolated individuals. We're, we're uh, connected human beings in a community. That's, I think, the most important thing. But, it is the other thing is that the dominant philosophy in the United States since Ronald Reagan is that government is the problem, not the solution. Oops, turns out it's the other way around. Government is the solution, not the problem. So uh, for this, when, when you have a crisis, you actually need a functioning government. And we see in Washington what happens when you elect leaders who don't believe that. You don't have preparation for a pandemic. You wipe out the office because who needs the federal government in a pandemic? Well, turns out everybody does. Uh, so the, the, the necessity of strong governmental institutions and capable leaders is now apparently is, is obvious. When we see Gavin Newsom, Andrew Cuomo compared to Donald Trump, not hard to see the difference. You know, mm -hmm. two smart, thoughtful, courageous leaders and an idiot. Um, and you don't have to guess which one I mean. Um, as, but, but it is, uh, so hopefully coming out of this, we'll have much better government, uh, more competent, more capable, more trusted. Uh, you know, it's a bit like, uh, you know, coming out of World War II. World War II, there was enormous amount of faith in national leadership, uh, having won the war, having climbed out of the Depression. Uh, so Eisenhower could pass things like the National Defense Highway Act and build the interstate highway system. We could launch NASA and go to the moon. We could begin to build, uh, you know, rebuild cities and so on. 
that was all possible because there was a lot of trust in uh, the, those institutions. Well, maybe we'll get that back again. Uh, you know, it, probably not at the federal level, at least until after November, uh, when we may, there's at least possibility of getting a government that does something. Um, but uh, at least until then, we're seeing at the state level, governments that are doing a very good job. And the final question a little bit is, you know, we've been talking uh, the future, but <clears throat> if you think way far out, you know, in, in, in to, you know, 2050 or even later in the century, when, when we look back here, I mean, it, it's hard to say, again, it's all happening around us, but what, what's the po probability that uh, we will see this in, in a way that's it's really a turning point or a, or a kind of a historical moment that people will remember in, in a really profound way? Well, I think there's little doubt that it's a historical turning point of, in one sense, you know, and if you were sitting in 1941, it might have been the beginning of a Nazi ruled era in the world, or it might have been the, ret the, the defeat of the worst forces and the rise of something quite wonderful. And we're there today. We don't know. You know, uh, uh, this could be the uh, uh, really beginning of a terrible period in human civilization, which is a possible scenario or it could be the reinvention of global collaboration as a result of dealing successfully with the worst crisis we've experienced in our lifetime. Both are plausible today. The latter depends upon the rise of new leaders. The former depends upon the persistence of ill will and people like Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump takes us down into a dark hole. And what's worse is that 40% of America don't believe that. Uh, you know, and so that's the big uncertainty for our country is, do we get control of the country again or not? Uh, and there is a hopeful scenario um, that, uh, that, you know, the Trump era ends in November uh, and, and we restore faith in government and leadership in the face of a crisis. And that would be a very big positive change. This is an opportunity to do the right thing at a national level. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. And uh, we'll hopefully, ha we'll continue having conversations with you and, and maybe have one this fall uh, when, when this all plays out. But uh, fantastic having you uh, really with us today and laying this out. And uh, really, it's always, always, always a great conversation. Thank you so much. Well, it's Peter. always great to be with you, Pete. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. All right. See you later. Bye-bye.